wake up today, Romans chapter 13, verse 11, okay? Romans 13, 11. Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone. The day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality, not in sexual promiscuity, sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh in regards to its lust. So every time, see if this doesn't ring, every time we hear a crisis, there is a crisis going on. I mean, whether it's a cultural crisis, whether it's a spiritual crisis, whatever. All, I mean, just people start saying, well, you got to wake up. It's time to wake up. Y'all ever heard that? Anybody said it's time for you to wake up? Y'all know what I'm saying? Y'all ever hear that? Or is it just maybe me? Okay? So you just, y'all better wake up. Things are going on. It's time to wake up. And I'm always asking, what does that mean? What does it mean? What, what does wake up look like? How do you wake up? Does anybody know to wake up? I mean, think about it. You, you go through history right here. In 1962, public prayer was taken out of school. Wake up. 1972, abortion became legal. Wake up. It got overturned recently. Thank goodness somebody woke up. And 2015, same-sex marriage became legal. What did we hear? Wake up. Wake up. In 2020, the church got shut down. It was called non-essential. What would you hear? Wake up. Wake up. Y'all remember that? We're hearing again now with lawfare and all this thing. Both sides. Democrats, Republicans, independents, all sides. Wake up. Y'all better wake up. We're losing democracy. Everybody's accusing the other person of doing somewhat what they're doing. Y'all ever seen that? I mean, it's like having two kids in the back seat on a road trip. <laughs> so what does it mean to wake up? Do we actually know? Is there an instruction guide about waking up? Actually, there is. And we're going to, it's called the Bible, which is why I love it. So God, here's the thing when you read the Bible, you understand it. God is extremely conscious of our tendencies to drift away and become complacent and compromise. That's why he's resourced us. He's, he, he knows this. See, the Bible talks about stuff because, not because it's new to us, it's because it's always been in place, this tendency to drift, this tendency to, to become casual and to not take things seriously or be sensitized to it. It's, there's always this issue. And so you always have to stay in that mindset. So he knows it, so he addresses it. So if it's not new to us, it's always been in place. So the cool thing about the Word of God is that there's a solution given to us, okay? So... He tells us in 2 Peter 1, 3, he says, Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So these resources exist. Now, the reason they don't get used is some may not know, some may not care, or some just don't believe, or there's just I'm, I'm just going to ignore it. And so it gets in there. So when we start talking about this, now listen, I want to put this wake-up call not in the context of culture or politics, but in the context of your walk with God. The reason that he's saying here it is time to wake up is because it's about pleasing God. That's the whole motive, okay? There may be cultural implications, there are going to be political implications, but the main, the main call here is that we wake up and understand what's happening spiritually. And the more we understand spiritually, the better prepared we are to handle things culturally, politically, all around. Okay? All right? All right, thanks for coming. So here we go. Most people, he starts talking out here in verse 11, there's a time sensitivity that he's going to bring in. Now, most people understand the speed of time. It goes fast. And I'm telling you, the older you get, the faster it goes. See, y'all, get thanks for being here today. All the old people said, you ain't kidding, preacher. I'm telling you right now. I'm just telling you, when you get over 40, that over the hill. <laughs> See, some of y'all thinking, well, 40 is not like it used to be. Uh-huh. 
It is. You just ain't hit the slides yet, all right? So that's right. That's right. And so you need to understand, understand, so it really speeds up. Like right now, I'm telling you, I never thought, it, it's just going so fast. And so most of us get the brevity of time, the speed of time, but where we mess up is the accountability of time. How do we use the time that we have? And, and all of us are on different clocks. Y'all know that? Earthly, we're all on different clocks. You know, people die young, people die old. Like my dad would used to call and he'd tell me about his friends dying. I said, Dad, what happened? He said he woke up dead. <laughs> so I'm just saying, so we're all on different clocks, but this accountability time, what are you doing? So what he's talking about, it's high time to wake up. Not necessarily because time is limited, because all time is limited, because how you're using the time that you have. Which is why Moses prayed this prayer. So teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. When you understand the accountability of time, you get wise. That you make the most of it. That you're not taking days for granted. It's always good to say, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Okay? The reason you say that is because he's giving you the opportunity. That day is the opportunity. It is an opportunistic day. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Every coach I ever had always asked the question, what are you going to do with this day? What are you going to do with this time? What are you going to do with this practice? How are you going to make the most of it? Are you going to waste it? Are you going to sloth through it? What are you going to do with it? Every day at work, what are you going to do? Every, seeing every day as an opportunity to achieve to whatever goal that is. And so there's this accountability of time. It's living with the understanding that every day we live has eternal expectations and significance. Every day you live has an eternal significance to it. And so the reality of time understands accountability, but it also builds anticipation. For he says, for now salvation is nearer to us than we believe. Uh, I was listening to a podcast this week, and, and they were dealing with the fact of how people say we're well, y'all keep saying we're living in the last days. We're living in the last days, and they've been saying it for so long. Well, I'll tell you this. We're nearer to the last days than when they started talking about the first century. We're in the last of the last days. They started talking about the first century. We're in the last of the last days. Y'all get it? So we're nearer to that. So it's near that. But he puts this in a positive sense. He says near to salvation. So in other words, he's talking about in terms of anticipation not just of judgment. We're not just to this place because, hey, listen, there's a bad thing coming. But he's telling them in this mind, our salvation, our deliverance, our rescue is closer than it's ever been. So if you're a believer and you're walking with the Lord, you're building anticipation. Every day brings you closer to the deliverance that you're looking for. Now, if you're, if you're not a believer or you're kind of walking in this carnal lifestyle where there's not a real sense of purpose to your salvation. You're, you're not living in anticipation. You're living in anxiety. See, or some of you say, I'm, I'm not living in either one preacher. I really don't think about it. What does that mean? Foolishness. And then we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Not to think back about one or the other means that you're not really thinking about anything. So every day brings us closer to our last day on earth and our first day in, in eternity. Now, we're all eternal be beings. We're going to live eternity out in one place or the other. So the idea here is not we're closer than you think, but we're closer than we were. That's the issue here. So Jesus promotes this urgency, not panic. There's a difference between urgency and panic. Urgency is there's a plan in place. I need to move quickly. Panic is, I need to do something. I don't know what it is. It's just not that way. Okay? So there's that panic in that place there. So Jesus puts it this way. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Now we're talking about what does wake up look like? Wake up understands the accountability of time. Every once in a while, parents will come to me and I'll say, Well, preacher, listen, I know, I know church is important and everything, but my child will always have the rest of their life to do church and stuff. They'll always have that. Well, here, I mean, there's just some, 
statistics out there that are mind-boggling right now. And it's changed. Last year, last year, 12%, 12% of Americans had a biblical worldview. This year, they just came out with a whole new study again. This year, it's at four. So we're losing ground. By the age of 13, by the age of 13, the most formative, the most have already formed a worldview opinion. The most formative years are between the ages of 8 and 12. That's the most formative years in cognitive learning. Let me ask Dr. Carling, your resident neuro PhD person. Does that sound about right to you? Okay, thank you. That was a really strong sure. I mean, I know you're, you're pregnant. There are things, I mean, things are, I mean, you okay? Is pregnant brain real? Is it? With you it is? Is that a neurological fact? Okay, well, there you go. All right, for everybody who's been pregnant, is pregnant brain real? Well, well there you go. Survey says... Why people come here to get real time research. (laughs) (laughs) So, what does it mean to have a biblical worldview? What does that actually mean? Well, there are seven cornerstones of a biblical worldview, all right? Now, only 3% of children right now embrace these cornerstones. One is God exists and and is the all knowing, all powerful, perfect creator and ruler of the universe. As a sinner, the only solution to the consequences of sin is to acknowledge your sins, ask God to forgive you through Jesus Christ, and rely on Him to save you from those consequences. Sin is real and significant. We are all sinners by choice. Your most important reason for living is to do what God wants. You trust the Bible because it's completely true and personally relevant to your life. The Bible provides a complete and reliable understanding of right and wrong. And number seven is success is consistently doing what the Bible teaches. Only 3% of children right now get that. So you would say, yes, it's now time to wake up to this biblical reality or spiritual quagmire. Because most of this generation base their belief on two things. Feelings and experience. Feelings and experience. That's That's where most of their belief is formulated. How they feel about things. What kind of experience did you have? I mean, so it's just in that deal. So, number one is time. Wake up. Why? Because it's time to wake up. There's an accountability to the time we live in. Number two is, it's time to take up the fight. He goes into strong language here about taking up armor. See, here's what I want to tell you something. As a believer, you don't have to pick a fight, but you do have to get in the fight. The fight's already in place. It's already... It's already been out there. So there's already a fight in place. You're really, it really is about what side you're fighting for. And there's never a side. Listen to what I'm going to say. There's never a side you're not fighting for. There's no neutral ground here. Okay. So it's time to take up this fight. So the nature of the conflict, Scripture tells us, Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we're all participating in this cosmic conflict. But the only way to know if you and what you're fighting for is you have to be intentional in the choice of choosing. Again, because not choosing is choosing. And I have to willfully, intentionally lay aside what he calls the deeds of of darkness. That's where he puts it here in verse uh, 12. He said, the night is almost gone. The day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And then in verse 13, he tells us, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. All six of these, all six of these come from the self-will, the pleasure of self, when self is on the throne. And so the deeds of the darkness and the deeds of flesh all driven by the same issue here. So, for instance, it says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, 
just as I have forewarned you that those who practice, and let me, let's, let's clear this up, what practice is, say this a lot, practice is that there is a willful, willful, consistent, permissive, this is your desire, it's the constant of your life, it's a consistent behavior that you are willfully participating in. So that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So as we move into this, there's this fight that we have to put on. And he says, put on the armor of light. But he also says, take off the deeds of darkness. Now here's this. You have to get this. Listen to me. Y'all listen. This is important. Because we live in this cover-up mentality. Same thing Adam and Eve tried to do in the garden. Remember what did Adam and Eve do? They sinned. And what did they do? They went and found some fig leaves and tried to cover up. And then Jesus asked, and understand this, Jesus never asked a question he didn't already know the answer to, kind of like your parents. So Jesus asked them, where have you been? And they said, why are you wearing these? He said, we were naked. He said, who told you we're naked? Because what they did is they covered up. Jesus had to go kill an animal. I mean, God had to go kill an animal. And put the skins on them because only blood can clean the sin. So what we like to do is we like to try to take this armor of light and put it on over our deeds of darkness. But he says you have to what? Lay it aside. That means you got to take it off. In other words, you got to get rid of it. you got to lay it down. That means that there is a conscious, willful understanding that you have to take it off. I'm going to willfully stop participating in these deeds of darkness, this work of the flesh. Again, we had this conversation last week. Oh, Bucky, that sounds really hard. It is, and I'm going to get into this just a second. It's going to be really good. Okay, so what we got to do, but you have to understand, it's not just taking this armor of light and putting it on. There has to be a laying aside of the dark deeds, okay? You can't be like the little boy that was in school. I mean, he kept getting up out of his seat, kept getting out of his seat. And what does he say his name was, I don't know, Scott. what you do or we go dusty we go either way go that way to sky okay either way okay we can say we can say well you're going to Uganda Danny we'll just say Danny all right so here it is so Danny or it could have been all three of y'all got this nature in you I'm pretty sure so anyway Danny would not stay in his seat would not stay in his seat and finally the teacher said Danny you sit down there right there and, hey, teachers, I know this is going to sound strange because it doesn't happen very often. Or I'm calling your parents. May not be your best hope there. But this, this took place in a time when parents actually came and took the teacher's side. That long ago. Yeah. So anyway, they called. He said, if you get up again, if you get up again, I'm calling your parents. And so Danny sat there. And, I mean, you could tell he was not happy. And he just looked at her and said, well, I'll tell you what. On the outside, I'm sitting down. But on the inside, I'm standing up. <laughs> See, that's what it looks like. That's what it looks like when we try to take, when we don't take stuff off. On the outside, it may look like the armor of light. But on the inside, it's still deeds of darkness. All right? So, you got to take it off. So there's an attitudinal shift. There's a thinking shift all about it to put on this armor of light. And so he tells us that we're to take up in Ephesians chapter 6, because this is a battle now. He says, therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist the evil day, resisting the evil day, and having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, watch this, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now watch this. Without the Bible, he's given us three resources that are essential to this and how we battle. You get Jesus, when you're saved, 
He puts the Holy Spirit in you. That's, that's the representative of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit living in us. You get the Word of God, the absolute, powerful, authoritative Word of God, and then you get the church. Those are three resources that we have in this battle to stand, along with the dress here. So when we get this in here, see, without those resources, without those resources, you're going to struggle to resist and you're going to struggle to stand. You understand what I'm saying here? Because he says, you're going to resist the devil. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. Okay, I think we're living in an evil day. So he's telling us we have a resistance. That means we don't have to give in. There is a resistance. Oh, please get this. Because see, some of you feel like there's no, I can't help it. I can't help it. I just can't help it. I can't resist. I can't resist. Well, again, remember, go back to 2 Peter when he says we have all the resources we need. We have everything we need to live in godliness. Everything. So in other words, you have to trust. You have to trust what he's telling you, okay? You have to trust. And so you're going to resist. You have these resources to resist. And then he talks about standing. So you've got to hold your ground. And, you ha- and he's given us the resources so that we can stand. That you don't have to give up ground there. Now, some of y'all are looking at me like, we, we like you, preacher. We like you, we really do, but we ain't real sure what you're saying right now. I'm trying to help you understand that there's got to be an attitudinal decision in your life it has to be conscious it has to be intentional it has to be willful to say to resist first you got to recognize what it is you're resisting most people don't even recognize what they're resisting so you got to recognize what you've got to resist and then you got to rely on who's empowering you to resist it so there's this issue here now watch this now that's just the hold to resist and hold firm But we're not. We're to progress. That's the shield of faith. And he's talking about these flaming arrows that are out there. I mean, the the type of arrows. I I always call them the 3D arrows. Deception, doubt, and delusion. The enemy always loves fear. Remember fear? False evidence appearing real? That's fear. Okay? So he loves to create fear... To keep us do this because we never, li- listen, the expectation is that we progress. We don't just stand there huddled up scared. Is that we're moving. We're moving. And he's constantly firing these arrows of doubt. He's constantly throwing these arrows of deception. He's throwing these arrows of delusion. And so the issue here, the picture here is, is that we're moving right here. But now watch this. See, some of some believers live in the no world. Well, all y'all do is just say, I'm against, I'm against, I'm against. And not understanding the four world. Okay? And your no, your no will not work effectively and biblically if your yes isn't bigger. You know why my no to other women is so good? Because my yes to that woman is really good. You're saying. Okay, let me get in your diet world. Can I get in your diet world? So, I, I don't talk about much. I don't talk about much. So, several years ago, I, I went to the doctor, and I mean, uh, health-wise, I mean, I've offered several doctor friends some help in their practice. <laughs> I did. I mean, I, I mean my, my doctor friend of my day, I just I said, listen, if you'll just give me a clipboard and let me walk in here, I can look at them and say, yeah, you need to lose weight and exercise. Telling you right now. I mean, I can hit them a couple times with a hammer. 
see what the reflexes are like. And I was willing to do that for $10 a patient. <laughs> Help out. Because, I, mean, that, I mean, that's what I felt like. I went in there, and so I went in there and saw my doctor, and he said, well, you got this. I mean, your blood pressure, all this. everything was terrible. And he started, he started making a list of these medicines and put me on. And I just looked at him and said, here's what I, here's what I ask you to do. Give me 30 days. If I don't turn around 30 days, I'll take the meds. Now, I'm not a doctor. I do have a doctorate. It's a DD. Didn't do it. It's an honorary doctorate. Okay? So I just want you all to know. So I'm not telling you don't go away. Well, the preacher said just stop taking medicine. No, I'm not. Make sure we get this recorded. Only with your doctor's approval. I'm not a doctor. Okay? I do have a degree in recreation. Now, if you want to play some duck, duck, goose, I can. I'm certified. All right? So, I went there and said, give me 30 days. And so, I went back 30 days. Numbers started getting there. Weight started going down. Started exercising and all this kind of stuff. And disposition changed. Weight I'm 80 pounds down still, 80 pounds. And the people ask God, how did you do it? My yes, my no to milkshake, sweet tea, gravy and biscuit. Anything with sugar. Bread, my yes to being healthy was greater than my no. You see what I'm saying? My no was so good because my other yes was there. See, see, here's the issue in your life. This is so good. See, your yes to Jesus has to be stronger than your no to sin. Or your no to sin will never work. If you don't know why, Jesus is your why. He is your yes if you don't get that, your no is going to get kind of shaky. You, you know what I'm saying? See, some of us are struggling in this wake-up call because we get all fired up and we get a really strong no. What Jesus wants us to live in is the yes, the full armor of God. So that our no isn't so shaky. It's fortified by our yes. And that's why you win the battle. Your yes is so good. It's just so good. And then there's just no negotiations. We're not negotiating this. This is not a non-negotiable. Where do you get that at, Bucky? It's right there in the Bible. Verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh in regards to the lust. In other words... Tell your flesh to shut up. Don't listen to it. You have to understand this. So how, how does that look? Listen, there are all kinds of warnings out there, but you cannot negotiate this. Listen to what it says. Now, that we're fixing to get into this, the very basics of where we're going to get there. So what does it mean to wake up? Ephesians 5, 14 and 18. So we're, we're not negotiating anything, so what are we going to do? How does it look like to wake up? What are, the, what are we getting to? For this reason, it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now watch this. Watch this. To live awake means that I'm going to live, I'm going to live carefully, not fearfully. The difference between living in fear and paying attention, alertness. Alertness. Hey, mom and dad, don't be scared about raising your kids today. Be confident and fearless in knowing that there's a truth to live there. And by the way, society at times, and we're, we're, we're nasty bad right now, but there have been other times in the world history in which it's been brutal. I'm reading in there where God's telling the Israelite, hey, stay away from this group of people right here. 
They're detestable. They burned their sons and daughters to an unknown God. Now, we're mutilating children. We're in that same concept. But he, listen, there have been times where culture's been barbaric, okay? So you live carefully, not fearfully. Live in wisdom, knowing truth. That's what he says here. Careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time. Live in wisdom, knowing truth, understanding truth, and applying truth. And then live daily with effectiveness and excellence. Make every day count. Let it be effective. Let it be an excellence. Now, you know I said a while ago when I said, if, if it doesn't matter about whether you're anxious or anticipation, you just don't care and think about it, that's foolishness. That's just foolishness. Because it says that, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So how do I understand the will of the Lord? Well, you have to be full of the Holy Spirit. That's that's the key to understanding the will of God. Well, how do you do that? That's Romans 12, 1 and 2, that you present everything in there. This is basically total surrender and commitment to the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's being awake. It's being awake. But again, you got three resources now. Remember, you got three resources, three alarm clocks. Three whatever to help you live this life. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Bible and the church. So one of the things I want to do as a body today is I want to wake you up if you're sleeping, if you're struggling. It gets tough. It gets weary. We talked about this last week. We, one of the reasons we sleep is because we get tired. I'm telling you right now, some of y'all need a nap. And some of you have already taken it while I'm talking. I'm just telling you, it's amazing some of the things that you, sometimes we get physically exhausted and when we're physically exhausted, it affects everything. Everything. But we have to pay attention to our warning signs. Hey, God never moves without a warning. Especially in judgment. But we ignore them. It's almost like we get used to the chaos. April 14th, 1912, Titanic. They received seven warnings about an iceberg. One from a ship of America that was on the same path they were, sent it and said, there is an iceberg. There's an iceberg in your path. Got ignored. And so the iceberg they told them about is the one that hit the, the, the ship hit. Pearl Harbor. You ever do a deep dive into the Pearl Harbor instance? There was a, a massive amount of evidence that said Japan was going to attack Pearl Harbor. Matter of fact, two commanders Two commanders went to the White House and they were removed because they were so passionate about saying, you cannot put the fleet in Hawaii. And they got fired. Dismissed. Everyone knew that there was an imminent imminent threat to the Pearl Harbor by Japan. Got ignored. Got ignored. 120 years, Noah saying, I'm building this boat. God's going to flood the earth. You need to get on. 120 years. Mock, ridicule, didn't listen. On the other side of that, in the book of Jonah, there's this place called Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go warn Nineveh. But God sent him to warn Nineveh. He tells Nineveh about God's coming wrath and that they need to repent. They repent and God spares Nineveh. But it's like we just refuse to pay attention sometimes. Right now, science is catching up with Scripture. I said that right. Science is catching up with Scripture. 
See, the assault right now on this generation is on the mind. 54% of kids have a, have a smartphone before 11 years of age. Now, what we know, research tells us right now, because we have the most anxious generation, by the way, between 13 and 17, it's 95%. 95%. Now, what we know right now is that we have the most anxious, hopeless generation. We call it a mental health crisis that we've ever had. But we keep, and, and they're tying it to this generation, they're tying it to social media and isolation. Because this generation is more social than it's ever been, but it's the least relational. Sitting down and have a face-to-face -face conversation can freak them out. You can. I mean, you go to restaurants. You watch families at restaurants. You, you go and watch them. Put the phone down. I'm an advocate. <laughs> All my students are going to love me right now. I don't think you ought to have a phone in school. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless Jesus. <laughs> You're right here. Oh, all my Gen Z people are going, yeah, no, I ain't shaking. And looking at your parents right now, you best not say that again. <laughs> I just think, because there are things out there, there are things, like, I mean, we're, it's like crack. The assault is to the brain. Right now, we can't hardly discern it all. You got AI coming up. AI. I mean, have you seen what they do with AI? I mean, I've got preacher friends that they now are teaching Spanish digitally. Their lips are moving. Spanish is coming out. And they don't know a lick of Spanish. I'm going to do that. Bien? <laughs> See, I'm a Spanish people right there. I'm sorry, we have a bilingual audience we have to communicate with sometimes. <laughs> See, I'm saying, so it, it's, it's hard to discern. They're creating things like AI. I mean, you, you understand this? I mean, they're AI. I mean, they're teaching AI. It's, it's, it, and by the way, it's, AI is not smarter, it's just faster. Now, for some of y'all, it's smarter. It's time to wake up. You have to wake up. And wake up means being alert to what God's doing. It's the consciousness of God. Conform to Jesus Christ. Walking in wisdom. Understanding the time. Understanding the fight. Being engaged in it. That's waking up. It's not just shouting wake up and having nothing else about it. It's about being aware of who God is, what God's doing, and what He's doing in you right now. When I talk to people, and they're telling me stuff about what's going on in their life, I'll, I ask them, what are you praying for? And they look at me, what do you mean? What are you praying for? And so they'll look at me and say, well, I'm... I'm just praying for discernment. Okay, so you know what God's going to do? God's going to put you in situations where you have to discern. Well, how do you grow discernment? Well, Scripture tells us that you grow discernment by obedience. You have to practice the will of God. So He's going to put you in situations that are going to test you. That are going to stretch you, to teach you. It's the same thing. People go, you better not pray for patience. Y'all ever heard somebody tell you that? Don't pray for patience. Oh, Lord, no, you... You'll meet some of God's most impatient creation in your life. I'm just telling you right now. Pest you. Y'all ever heard that? Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Every parent, you birth a patience test. <laughs> Amen? So, I mean, how, how do you grow patient? I mean, you put yourself in situations. You get, you get in uncomfortable situations. Uncomfortable situations. You know how they prepared us? Whether it's football, basketball, they kept putting, 
it was a coach's design to put us in uncomfortable situations so that we'd be comfortable later. To create stress in our life to handle stress. To make us uncomfortable. So that we would get comfortable when the uncomfortable came. And confident. You know how to handle it. It wasn't strange. It wasn't weird. It's the same thing about waking up. If you're staying alert, when he tells us to stay alert, that means your prayer life is on, on point. You're in the Word of God. You're paying attention. you got people speaking to you. There's accountability. You're not living in isolation. You're awake. And you're also in the business of stirring other people up to be awake. It's not just about keeping you awake. It's that you understand that you've got to help others be awake. And not, again... I'm not talking politically, culturally, I'm talking spiritually. But I know this in my life. The more spiritually sensitive I am, the better I discern everything else around me. I'm awake. Stay awake. Now, the key, now he's telling this to the church. They have to wake up. So that means there was a time they were awake before they got sleepy. For some, it's not wake up. Listen to me. It's give up. What does that mean? Some of you have to give up your life in order to get his. That's salvation. That's coming to a place in your life where you recognize, you know something? I can't stand. I can't resist. I can't move forward spiritually unless I give up my life. Now, here's the cool thing. Now, you say, Bucky, I I can't give up my sin. What, What do I do? This is the wonderful thing. He takes it. He takes it. He takes the sin. Where did he take it? To the cross. He took your sin upon himself so that we'd have no sin. Isn't that amazing? Well, how do I get that? I give up. I admit, one, I am a sinner. Two, I confess that, that I am a sinner. And repent, God, I got to give it up. And then I ask him to do what he desires to do. And by the way, the only one that can save you wants to save you. That's a pretty good combination. So you ask him, Father, save me. Forgive me. Save me. I give up. I surrender. I surrender. Now, if you're here and you're a believer and you just, you're all the time mad about world events. He didn't say get enraged. He said wake up. Now there's enough out there to make you mad. Amen? I'm just telling you. But a church that's fully awake, a believer that's fully awake, a household that's awake, oh my, oh my. We got here because there's a slumbering church. Well, what do we do? We wake up. We wake up. Well, how do we wake up? Everybody has to have the responsibility of waking up. And stop blaming other people who may be asleep. And wake up. And wake up. Let's pray. For more content like today's podcast, click right here. For sermons, click right here. And again, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Have a blessed day.